God is good, ain't he? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come thanking thee for another day's journey. We come with thanksgiving in our hearts, Heavenly Father, thanking you that you blessed us all week long. And then, Heavenly Father, we come with just thanksgiving, just thanking you for this and thanking you for that. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless everyone that's under the sound of my weak voice. We ask that you bless this church as a whole, Heavenly Father. We ask that you, where there's wants and desires, Heavenly Father, you know what we need, Heavenly Father. And then, Heavenly Father, bless the bereavement all over the land and country. Heavenly Father, we ask to bless those that's in hospitals and nursing homes. And then, Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless our families, Heavenly Father. Some, Heavenly Father, is standing in the need of a lot, Heavenly Father. And we ask that you bless them. And then, Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless our pastor here, Heavenly Father, that he will keep delivering the word of God, Heavenly Father, that we will save some lost soul. And then, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We just thank you. We just thank you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, as, your, as the lights come back on, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> I meant to say during the announcements, and I, I failed to, Tiffany has brought uh, some CDs. And uh, um, I think most everybody has a copy, but if you don't have one, there's some on the table. And I've got plenty uh, as well. So um, if you don't have one, grab one. If you have one and you want to give another one away to somebody, grab one and make sure you give it uh, to somebody. But I appreciate uh, Tiffany so much, her servant heart, letting us just use these however, however we can. So they're on the table in the back um, as you leave. <clears throat> We're going to continue looking at spiritual gifts. We've been looking at these now for a few weeks and uh, just want to kind of continue that series. Talking about ministry gifts today. In order to get to where we're going, I want to back up just a little bit and just remind you a little bit about our church, uh, mainly the vision of our church. As a church, it's on our newsletter uh, every Sunday, but if you shorten that vision down, basically the vision of our church is to experience authentic relationships with God and each other. That's what we want. We want people to feel real. We want people to, to understand that we're all in a different place uh, in our relationship with Christ. And it's about following Christ. It's not about some of the other things that sometimes we get um, bogged down in in this thing that we call religion. Uh, but really, our goal and our desire is for people to have authentic relationships with God and each other. And those two do go hand in hand. If you have a relationship with God, you will have a relationship with other people. And, but really, you can't really have a true, meaningful, authentic relationship with other people unless you first have that authentic relationship with God. Outside of that, things become very, very superficial. And so one of our goals then is authenticity. Our desire is to, is to connect people to God and to each other by ministering to the entire person. And that idea of a holistic approach, trying to minister to, to all the needs that people have, is difficult, it's time-consuming, it's sacrificial, it's all those things, but really it comes from a conviction of what the word salvation means anyway. In the Bible, when the word salvation is used in the New Testament, it's a Greek word, uh, and the idea behind that word is to be made whole again. That's really what it's talking about. The Bible makes it clear in Genesis 3 that because of sin, first of all, in Genesis 1 and 2, God created us perfect. We had a relationship with Him, but then because of sin, something has been broken. Our relationship with God has been broken. As a result, our relationship with other people are broken as well. And so if you see the whole story of the Bible, it's about people who are broken. 
And then Christ comes on the scene. He takes our brokenness to the cross. He dies for our sins and our brokenness. And He's risen again from the dead. And the Bible uses this word uh, that says salvation. That when we confess Jesus as Lord, we are saved. We're made right with God. But part of what that means is that, we are, that He wants to make us whole again. You see, we've been broken physically. I mean, because of sin, all of us will die physically. Unless we're alive when Christ returns. Many of us, ourselves and our loved ones, we know they have all kinds of physical issues. And so we're broken physically, we're broken emotionally, psychologically. There are all kinds of problems that people have and we all kind of have our own baggage because we're broken psychologically. And then of course we're broken spiritually. And we do a really good job, and I think the church has done a really good job emphasizing making us whole again spiritually, trying to, to break, trying to, to mend that relationship. But Jesus wants to save us, and when He saves us, He wants to put us back together again, and He wants to make us whole again physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And so if you see the ministry of Jesus, that's what He is doing when He is healing people. And when He is praying over people and touching them. All the people who come to Christ, they have emotional needs, they have physical needs, and they have spiritual needs. And Jesus sets out to meet every one of those. And then He tells us as a church, we are to continue that ministry. And how do we do that? Well, we do it through spiritual gifts. And so we believe that the result of ministering to the whole person is a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ making a difference in their world. And such a person like that will experience authentic relationships with God and with each other. And such a person will desire to discover their spiritual gift. And when, we, when people talk about discovering your spiritual gift, they're mainly talking about the motivational gifts that we looked at last week. And so a fully committed disciple of Christ wants to discover their, their spiritual gift, their motivational gift, so that it can be used in ministry. In other words, at FCC, we believe every member is a minister. Not just me. In fact, really, you want to know something? If we really want to make a difference in our community... If we really want to make a difference into the community that God has called us, if all people are looking for is me to make that difference, we're in trouble. It's going to take you, every member of minister, because you guys are connected to people who may or may not receive anything I have. But you're there. They know you. They're watching you. They know you're associated with this particular church. They're watching you. And you have doors open to you for ministry that I don't have. So every member is a minister. The Apostle Paul introduces this topic of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. That's kind of been our, our theme verse as we move through this. And in that particular passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You see, one of the issues facing the church in Corinth was, this, was they were divided. And one of the things they were divided over was this use and misuse and abuse of a certain spiritual gift. And so Paul's main concern for the church was that they would achieve unity. And he knew that unity and spiritual gifts go together. Unity is a result of everyone working together, using his or her gift in ministry. We are a team and we need to move forward. And so spiritual gifts should unite us, not divide us. But too often in the church, spiritual gifts have divided us. And so that concern for unity is also what prompts Paul to write about spiritual gifts to the church in Ephesus. In fact, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, at least in my Bible, if you have some type of study Bible where it kind of gives headings to these different paragraphs... The, the heading over chapter 4 in my Bible is unity in the body of Christ. And so Paul, again, is talking about unity. And the, and the first thing he wants to talk about when it comes to unity is spiritual gifts. Just like he did uh, for the Corinthians. And so if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, if you look at the whole letter, Ephesians is divided into two parts. In chapters 1 through 3, Paul discusses the church's position in Christ. Who they are and where they are now. And just as an example of that, I've got it on the screen, but look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19, Paul writes, 
Consequently, he's writing to the church, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Paul is saying, look, here is your position. You are now in the family of God. You're not on the outside looking in. But because Christ is your Savior, you are now, you're not a foreigner, you're not a stranger to this kingdom of God, but yet you are now a member of God's household. This is your position in Christ. And then he goes on in verse 22 and says, And to him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is your position in Christ. You are now part of God's family and God wants his Spirit to move through you to build the body of Christ. That's your position in Christ. And he spends the first three chapters talking about that. But then he concludes this chapter, look at oh, this section, look at chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You are part of the body of Christ. The Spirit wants to move through you. And He can do immeasurably more than you can ever even think or imagine. And so the first three chapters, He talks about our position in Christ. And then, beginning in chapter 4, He gives some practical exhortations of daily Christian lifestyles. Now, here's what you do. Here's how you live your life as a follower of Christ. In other words, since God's Spirit lives within us, we're to live in a certain way. And one of the first things that he discusses is how Christ has given the church certain ministry gifts. Now when we look at these gifts, I need to just kind of point that out. That what Paul now is talking about is, look, there are some gifts, you know, the Holy Spirit gives each believer spiritual gifts. But in addition to those spiritual gifts that he gives believers, there are certain gifts that God has given the church. Roles or offices that people play inside the church. And so these are gifts to the church and they're ministry gifts. But before we get there, remember, based on what we've looked at so far, based on 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 6, we've divided spiritual gifts into three categories. First are the motivational gifts, and these are given by God the Father, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 tells us. Motivational gifts are creational gifts. They are permanent gifts. There are seven of them mentioned in Romans, and there's, so there's seven motivational gifts. And, and, and you have one of those. You see. This is why you do what you do. It's your motivational gifts. But then there are gifts that are called ministry gifts that are given by God the Son. And that's what we're going to look at today. And then next week, manifest, uh, manifestation gifts. Gifts that are distributed by the Holy Spirit. They're the result of the way God manifests Himself through you. And so really, it's this way. Motivational gifts are why you do what you do. Ministry gifts are what it is you are doing. Manifestational gifts are how God shows up and manifests Himself through you in that situation. Motivational gifts are permanent. They don't change. Your ministry gift does and will change. And your, and your, and your manifestational gifts change all the time as well. But those, that motivational gift doesn't change. And so let's look at ministry gifts. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's read it and then we'll go back and look at it a little bit closer. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 3, he says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he says in verse 7, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. The word grace is where we get the word charismatic from. It's charis. It means favor. It has to do with the grace gifts that God gives. And so he says, but to each one of you, each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. The word translated apportion is where we get our English word meter from. 
And so it's a measurement. The New American Standard translates it that way. That we get the spiritual gift according to how Christ has measured it out for us. Whatever your spiritual gift is, there's no need. In fact, you can't do this. There's no need to become haughty or to think you're better than something else, than somebody else, because you've done absolutely nothing to deserve it. Christ gives it to you as He sees fit. It's His grace that measures it out to us. And so he says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why he says, and here Paul is quoting directly from Psalm 68, 18. When he, speaking of Christ, the prophecy of Christ, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. Verse 9. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. In other words, Jesus Christ, Philippians tells us, was God and is God, but he took on the form of man and lowered himself, Philippians says, to become like a man and then even lowered himself even more by dying for us. So he ascended, but first he descended into even the lower earthly regions. Verse 10. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And so now, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father and He is holding everything together, Paul tells us. He descended, but now He has ascended even high. But He has given gifts to man. And look at verse 11. It was He, Jesus. It was He who gave some to be apostles... Some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And so there are the five ministry gifts, or at least the offices given to the church. These gifts that are given to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why are they given to the church? Well, verse 12 tells us. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so Paul is saying, look, it is Jesus Christ who has given the church these particular offices or ministry gifts. But the reason He has given those gifts to the church is so that those people could equip the people in the church to do their ministry, you see. And so there are five ministries given to the church, or five roles, but yet there are multiple ministry gifts given to the church because every single one of you have a ministry that God has called you to do. And so let's look at those five a little bit closer. These five ministry gifts. First, apostles. Literally, the word apostle means one sent forth or a delegate. An apostle is someone with a message like an ambassador from one country to another. In the New Testament, the word apostle, apostle was used in two different ways. There was a general sense and then a specific sense. Specifically, the New Testament uses the word apostle to refer to the original twelve disciples of Jesus, plus Paul and plus Matthias who took Judas's place. And so the word apostle is used for those particular individuals. In a more general sense, however, in the New Testament, the word apostle refers to a number of individuals who spread the gospel in various locations and plant churches and took leadership positions over groups of churches. And so it should be obvious that there's a special kind of anointing and a special calling that will not be repeated on those original twelve apostles. That should be obvious. But yet, it should also be just as obvious that God still uses apostles today. Not on the same level as those twelve, but He still gives to the church people who have this office of apostleship. No one can claim that the same type of apostolic authority that Peter had or Paul had, no one can claim that. But to suggest that this gift or this office of apostleship ended when those twelve died is a misunderstanding of Scripture, I think. 
None of these grace gifts will cease to exist according to Paul until verse 13. Look what he says in verse 13. Well, if you go back, let's look at verse 11 again. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, how long will this last? Until we all reach unity in the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So when will that take place? When we see Jesus. And so until Jesus returns, these offices are still in the church. If that's not clear, in Corinthians 13, where Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. When will we know in part? Now we know in part. When will we know in full? When will we have the full knowledge of Christ? When we see Him. And when He returns for us. But until then, these things continue. What then is the gift of apostle, this office within the church? Well, a person with the ministry gift of apostleship has been gifted by Christ with the special ability to extend the work of the church, opening new fields to the gospel, and overseeing larger sections of the body of Christ. That's the apostle. In a sense, when I came back to restart a church that was here, trying to open up new ground because of what we're doing, in a sense, that's an apostleship. Again, nowhere near on the same level as Peter and Paul and those guys. And no special revelation and all that. But this overseeing a group. Dr. Davis performed that for us years ago. Kind of just oversaw a group. Or there are people who oversee groups of churches. Um, for a while, and this happened, some still, you know, Tim and Di Keener were in France. And then we had uh, some other friends who came here for a while and then went to Missouri to start a church. And we've had some other friends who came here for a while and were part of our church and they went to this area to start a church and they went to that area to start a church and so forth. And then periodically they still call me to get advice and, and to do different things. And so in a sense, that's the role of an apostle or Wayne Drain, if you remember him, when he comes to see us. He kind of operates in that way, helping overseeing things and just giving us guidance and it, that apostle. The office. Apostle. But then he says, God also gave the church not only apostles, but prophets. Now we looked at the prophet last week because prof the prophet or prophecy is a motivational gift. It's also a ministry office, but then it's also a manifestational gift that we'll see next week. The prophet within the church, a prophet's role is to warn people of sin and cause people to repentance. The prophet reminds us of truths that are already in God's Word. A prophet can give new insight and new understanding and can warn us what may happen in the future under particular conditions and tell us what will happen if we don't change. However, we got to understand that even this person who plays the role of a prophet, that person's prophecy is never equated with God's revealed word already found in the Bible and in Scripture. It's just speaking forth the word of God. There's one or two people in our church. I'm not going to mention the names because I didn't get their permission. But there's one or two people in our church who kind of function in that role. And when I'm thinking about something or, or different, I've gone to them and said, look, here's what I want you to pray about. Tell me what God tells you about this situation. And they have insight. And they sometimes unsolicited will come to me and say, I'm worried about this. And I'm, okay, what, what is it? That's the role of a prophet. You see, the office of prophet. And then he says, evangelist. An evangelist is one who announces the gospel. It's a teller of a good message. An evangelist keeps 
the message of Christ constantly before the church and trains and encourages believers to share faith with others. You know when a person is operating with this office of evangelist because every time you do something in the church, every time you try to do a program or, or, or you have a, a, a food distribution or you, um, you, know, you, you have a meal together or you, you have some type of block party, there's people who want to know, yeah, but was Jesus shared in that? Did somebody tell people about Christ? Did anybody come to Christ during that? They're constantly saying, look, all this stuff is good. Good, but you've got to make sure you don't forget to tell people about Jesus and all of that good stuff that you do. And we need people like that to remind us of what's really important. And so the evangelist, every one of us is called to share our faith with others. Every one of us is called to do that. So we're all, in a sense, called to the ministry of evangelism. But this gift is an, is an extraordinary way that people have to encourage others to do the same thing. As far as the church world as a whole, maybe somebody like Billy Graham is an example of someone who holds that office. The evangelist. And then he mentions pastors. The common word here is shepherd. Paul uses the word as a metaphor to describe those who take care of, lead, feed, and protect a local assembly of believers. And so here's what the pastor does. The gift of pastor is this special ability that God gives certain members of the body of Christ to assume a long-term personal responsibility for the spiritual welfare of a group of believers. Now, I've told you that I think my motivational gift is teaching. But right now, God has called me to this ministry role of pastoring a group of people for the long haul. It's the role that I feel within the church. But here's the thing. God has called me to this ministry, but I perform my pastoral duties like a teacher would. Somebody who has the motivational gift of prophecy, but as God has called them to pastor a church, would do it totally different than I would. Does that make sense? Somebody who's, who, has called, uh, who has the motivational gift of mercy, and God has put them in the position of pastoring, would pastor far differently than I do. Because that motivational gift is going to affect how they carry out their ministry that God has given them. And then he says, teachers. Teachers like prophecy. It's not a manifestational gift, but teaching is used as a motivational gift as well as a ministry gift. And within the church, teachers serve the church by making the unchanging message of God's Word understandable. Teachers clarify truths and keep the body of Christ from errors in doctrine. Now these five gifts are offices or roles people play within the body of Christ. But remember what Paul said. Christ has given these ministry roles to the church so that they can prepare the people in the church for their ministries. And so there are far more ministries than just these five. Those five are roles or offices in the church. They serve, these people serve as trainers and resource people to equip the people in the church for their own ministry. And so a person's ministry gift is what that person does within the body of Christ to build up people in their faith. A person serving in a ministry gift office serves to prepare God's people for works of service. And again, I gave you an illustration of how I think it works for me. Myself, my ministry gift is that of a pastor, but I perform that using my motivational gift. A person with the motivational gift of prophecy would find a perfect fit being a prophet within the church, but that's not always how it works. A person with the motivational gift of service, giving and mercy, would find fulfillment in the church, having a ministry of encouragement or helping other people. And so there are ministries that all of us are called to perform. There are plenty of opportunities for you to minister within the body of Christ. Your job is to first understand your motivational gift and then be open for God to use that in your place of ministry, whatever it may be. My job is to equip you, to prepare you for that. So then, how do you find out your ministry? Well, what shape are you in? God has shaped each and every one of us differently and uniquely for our place to serve Him within the body of Christ. So what shape are you in? Here's how you can 
get some insight in discovering your ministry. First, what is your spiritual gift? That's the first step. And what we mean by that is your motivational gift. Is your motivational gift prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, or showing mercy? Well, how do you know what it is? Well, you pray and you ask God to show you. Read over Romans 12 over and over again where he mentions those seven gifts. Take the motivational gift survey that we passed out last week and there's some on the information table in the back just to kind of give you insight into what your motivational gift may be. But discover your... Start trying to discover and what is my gift? What is God equip me to do what is unique about me what is this thing that I just can't get away from no matter what situation I'm in I'm always teaching them all I'm always trying to point out right and wrong or I'm always wanting to serve I'm always wanting to lead I'm always willing to give those kind of things what is your motivational gift and then when discovering your ministry consider your heart as you are determining your spiritual gift, do some soul searching and answer this question. What am I truly passionate about? That's what the heart means. Is what, where is your passion? What am I passionate about? Here's another question. If there were one thing you would like to see our church do, what would that one thing be? Because that may be where your passion is and that may be God saying... Here's your ministry. Here's another clue that may tell you what your passion is. What do you most complain about? Right? Oh, I wish so and so would do. I don't understand why our church doesn't do this. I don't understand what in the world's wrong with Kevin. He doesn't do this. Da, 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 da. What, what in the. You see, because chances are what you're complaining about is what you're passionate about. And instead of complaining about it, God's trying to get you to see, quit complaining and do something about it. You see? That's your gift. That's your heart. What's your spiritual gift? What's your heart? What are your abilities? What are you passionate about, but also what are you passionate about that you can also do well? Your abilities might give you some insight into what your place of ministry is. For example, I am passionate about worship. I mean, you know, not to put anybody on a pedestal because we try not to do that, but I love our praise team. Man, I'm passionate about that. But you know what? They don't want me on the praise team. <laughs> I may be passionate about it, but I have no ability. You know, I don't think God's going to miraculously, when I get behind the keyboard, say, boom, now you can play the keyboard. I, you know, I, I can't play the drums. <laughs> I've got two strikes against me when it comes to playing the drums. One is I don't have any rhythm because I'm white. <laughs> All right. You see, and the second is I grew up in a real conservative church where you didn't play drums. And so I can't come over, you know, I've got a lot, I'm passionate about it, but I don't have the ability to do it. And so I've got to ask myself, where am I, what am I good at? Where is my, and now how can I use that ability in ministry? You see. What's your personality? God has created each of us with unique personalities. Some of us are extroverts, some are introverts. Now, if you want to know a miracle, let me tell you, there's a miracle go that goes on in my life almost every day. And this is, God's got a sense of humor because you see, personality-wise, I'm an introvert. But yet, every, almost every day of my life, God has said, your place is to stand up in front of people and talk. Now, isn't that funny? <laughs> Uh, you see, so every time you see me get up, this is a miracle of God. Because, you know, it, but, but still, what's your personality? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Are you a thinker? Are you a doer? Are you a talker? Are you more of a listener? How God has created you, the very essence of who you are, can give you some insights. Now, God, like me, might change that. He uses it because of thinking and all that. But, you know, what is my personality like? 
And then another way you can find out your shape or what God has called you to do maybe is your experiences. God never wastes a heartache. And He never wastes a blessing either. Through the experiences you have had, good and bad, God has shaped you for particular ministry. You know, I can stand up and I can take people to God's Word and I can teach them some things, what the Bible says about drug abuse and alcohol abuse and all those kind of things. I can show you those things from Scripture. But someone who has gone through that and God has brought them through that, they can have a far more effective ministry doing that than me. Does that make sense? I mean, I can tell you what the Bible says about going through a, a, a horrible disease or losing a loved one. You know, uh, uh, you know I, can, I can tell you what the Scripture says about all that. But yet, when you know someone who has gone through that experience, and then they can tell you how God brought them through that experience, man, alive, what a ministry that is. And so your educational experiences, your occupational experiences, your painful experiences, your good experiences, your ministry experiences all serve to make you the minister that God wants you to be. Every member is to be a minister and your ministry will be most effective and fulfilling when you are using the gifts and abilities that God has given you according to your heart's desire in a way that best expresses that spiritual gift. Every member a minister Every saint, a servant. You have been called to do, everybody in this, you have been called to do something. That ministry God has called you to maybe when you get home to go next door to a neighbor's house and you know is struggling with something and just say, hey, can I pray for you? That's a ministry. P ministry of prayer. Ministry of encouragement. Ministry of giving. Ministry of, you know what, I, you know, I'm good at baking cookies. I'm going to go bake some cookies and take them to someone who I know just needs to be encouraged today. That's a ministry. You see. That's a ministry. If your motivational gift is compassion and mercy and you do that, well, man, you are right in your wheelhouse. You see. But what is it that God has called you to do. He's called you to do something. And, and whatever it is, is to share the love of Jesus in a practical way. So what can you do? Seriously, ask him, what can I do? And then when the Holy Spirit tells you what you can do, the next question then is, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it? You say, yeah, I'm going to wait until I know what my spiritual gift is, then I'll do something. No, you got it backwards. You follow God's lead, you do what He asks you to do, and then you discover your spiritual gift through the process of doing, not in waiting. What are you doing? Or what can you do? Why aren't you doing it? Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this day and just for your word, Lord. And Father, I know each of us, uh, deep down, we want our lives to matter. We want to be significant. We want to follow you. And Lord, the secret to all of that is finding our gift and then using that gift in ministry. So Lord, maybe there's some people in this room who you've called to these particular roles or offices in the church. Lord, I pray you would help them to follow up with that. But Lord, maybe most of us, we don't have that particular role, but yet we're in this church learning from people so that we can be equipped to go out and to do our ministry, whatever that may be. So Lord, show us what our ministry is. Show us what we can do. And then Lord, give us the courage to do it. And Father, as we're doing all these things, help us, Lord, to pray and just continually search your face to say, to, for your spirit to show us that motivational gift. Lord, help us to be just submitted to you because, Father, we want to be used by you. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. If you would, stand with me. And as our final prayer, let's say this together. Say this with me. Not me, but we. Not them, but us. Not us, but him. Amen. You're dismissed.